return after this uh, prolonged break. The next talk has the wonderful title, The Cogwheel of Flesh. <laughs> and um, please <laughs> have a warm welcome for the two expedition leaders, Frau Fili and Argonai. Oh, great, thank you. Oh, so we can move to the next slide. Brilliant. So what is this all about? Journalists get a lot of letters from their readers. Um, also, moderators, people who moderate profes professionally, like Philly. And one of them contained the this wording. Do you know, sensor, cogwheel of flesh, you are nothing, you're just a number, you're just like all of us, but you don't realize it because otherwise you wouldn't be doing your sensory, censoring bullshit. None of us has um, the courage to, to change their life and to put their life against the, these people. So like the courageous men's and women's in other countries who lives and you live from our lowly wages and you stupid Jews. So journalists get a lot of um, unwelcome mail. That's always been that way. That even, you know, that was the same in the times before the internet. But recently, in the recent years, um, everybody seemed to get the impression that everyone was complaining about the stuff that was happening um, on the internet at the time. So, like, you know, you could create the slogan, Where's the where the internet is, there is also hate. It doesn't work really well in English. Like Katrin Göring Eckert, um, a politician of the German Green Party, um, who um, has apparently had um, comments censored because of her name Göring. Um, and she sat down and read out some, some emails she received, some hate mail. Or for instance, uh, um, what happened to me yesterday at the um, ticket sales in the German, uh, the Berlin train station. Or what? Or even even worse, um, the nomination for the uh, German TV prize, um, where Anja Reschke was nominated um, for her comment against uh, the right-wing movements that have been surfacing in, in Germany recently, where the um, emotions have sort of been boiling up. And now, journalists are starting to write letters to their readers and letters to their public. And this isn't just happening to journalists, but also to bloggers who um, complain about the state of their comment sections. And I was at a conference in Berlin recently. Alexander Kluge was there too, a German intellectual, a bit older than um, average. And according to him, the internet is great and it uh, confirmed Brecht's radio theory, where he um, formulated his ideas about uh, broadcasting, that uh, broadcasting should be in a medium media of interaction where there's a back channel from the receivers to the senders. And a lot of, like for, for many, many years, when there was a debate about uh, the role of media, there was this debate about the back channel so that the people who consume the media should have the opportunity to um, address themselves to the, uh, to the author. And Alexander Kluger said that this has now happened, but it's sort of left a stale taste that you can see from all the, um, all the reactions, because many of, many of them aren't, aren't very pleasant to read and very nasty, in fact. Um, and you could say that the comments below newspaper articles have turned into into 
a corner of filth, and that's um, Philly's main main task. She she has to clean up these corners of filth, and there's a certain unhappiness about this. This is not just about the uh, about the refugee situation. It's um, it's happened earlier than that. The newspapers had started to close their comment sections. It might be due to um, economical reasons, but it might also be due to the fact that they didn't really um, know how to moderate comments. And then there are media like Facebook, which we won't be talking about a lot today, where everything is essentially comment. And many people are unhappy with this. Like many media have these Facebook channels where they you know, into which they pump their, their content. And the stuff that goes back is often slightly unpleasant. On the other hand, many media professionals are, are convinced that, hmm, you know, that initially you mirrored the media you had in print online. And now publishers understood that, you know, ancillary copyright is not going to save them you need to invest in digital. That's going to be the future. And you can, you can be unhappy with the general state of affairs. Nothing is, um, nothing is less dignified to people of culture than to, um, than to be governed by... Well, this this always this is always a case, and you can always you can you can pull a long rant about the state of comments on the internet, and um, the state of politics, and well, TV is always crap. There's nothing good on, and oh god, radio. I mean, it's 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 an outrage, really. No, but seriously, in a in a free and liberal society, you need to have an open culture of debate, where you must be allowed to be against the. Current um, current state of affairs. That's just good style in a democracy, and even more so in a liberal society. But if we think about the situation in a dictatorship, then these um, these rights are in danger, like the right to free speech, and that's why it's important to fight for them. Because under the um, under con conditions of a dictatorship, there are always hard sanctions against um, the opposition. And the, uh, the, uh, the example I just, I just told you about, that was from the first leaflet of the White Rose, the, the, um, who um, opposed the, uh, the, the Nazis. And um, they, they typed this on, on a typewriter. And of course, the Nazis weren't exactly happy about this. And you, as you all know, the uh, the White Rose movement um, was sentenced to death because due to their four leaflets that they published. And um, yes, well, the situation today is entirely different. Nobody's killed, but there are still sanctions in place. And um, we have to th have to consider how much free speech we want to have. What's where's the balance? And there are always going to be opinions that we we aren't happy with. For instance, when you know people don't show good style in their in the way they express themselves, or people who deny the Holocaust, nasty things like that. You might have noticed. Um, I I fulfilled Godwin's law at the very beginning of my talk. I, s I started with a with a Nazi comparison, that's been established quite early on the internet. Um, the longer uh, a discussion lasts on the internet, for instance, in news groups, I don't know how many of you remember news groups, but it was, uh, you know, a bit like mailing lists, uh, in the mailing lists of the early internet. And Godwin's law states that the longer a discussion lasts on the internet the m more likely it becomes that there's going to be a Nazi comparison. This is oft often used sarcastically. Um, and there's a rumor 
that uh, the argument is always is immediately won by the opposition as soon as somebody makes a nasty comparison, but unfortunately that doesn't work in practice. But these sarcastic rules, well, when discussion goes off the rails, then you have these auto-regulation measures, that, you know, you have laws like these as auto measures for auto-regulation. And of course, you might say that they're harmless Hitler comparisons. For instance, um, looking at the uh, the documentation program of the German news channel N24. But you, in general, you can say when there's the internet, there there are going to be trolls. They're inseparable. And in uh, the age of Newsnet, Usenet, there were hard rules. For instance, tofu, the uh, the tofu way of citing. You, you're not you're not supposed to quote everything the people above you said, but that's you know that's been violated today. I mean, oh, that's no longer in place today. Even if you just write one line in an email, you're going to be people are going to uh, going to be annoyed if you don't quote everything below it. So the people of the of, of the Usenet, of course, had a technical background um, because it was very, very early days of the internet and today's conditions are entirely different. And, um, you know, laws that you're, you're trying to establish, they're not going to be eternal. Everything changes the, the good practices. And yes, the... With regard to all these Nazi comparisons, um, the uh, like even the big ones are doing it. Hillary, for instance, um, Hillary Clinton compared the uh, compared the annexion of of Crimea with Hitler, and Schäuble, the German Minister of Finance, did the same thing. And um, of course, in return, people compare Hitler, uh, compare Schäuble to Hitler because of his stance in the Euro debate. I I think you can't really say that um, uh, Godwin doesn't happen outside the internet. Well, it's interesting in that context, just because I'd already mentioned her in a positive context. In this commentary from, from August, uh, she, well, she made another comment, a commentary, which was very popular, um, about the commemoration of the liberation of Auschwitz uh, concentration camp. And what was shocking to, to me personally, I was uh, I was attentive. I, I was listening to this presentation, and she well managed to to draw the line or draw the, get it together with with a situation in in Dresden with a Pegida with the right wing demonstrations, which I found a bit extreme. So that's a kind of um, Hitler comparison ultra, which were well where I just tread carefully. Well, my job here is to really water down the wine a bit, so uh, obviously the journalists are critical about uh, the backlash from the net, and I'm trying to give the other side just to say, well, what journalism is doing isn't that really perfect either. And so what uh, this, this topic was um, a summary of, of Süddeutsche Zeitung, German Daily, um, Thomas Middelhoff, um, media house manager, um, who was is, who is arrested, who was in, in, in prison, and uh, he is, for many, the incarnation of a, of a greedy, arrogant... Um, why didn't he... Why hasn't this un guy understood this himself? This is, this is a demagogue strategy. This is... Um, well, if you just try and imagine the comments under under this under this newspaper's uh, tweet, well, you can. There were pe even people um, demanding that oh uh, well this this person be well publicly executed. That doesn't take long. But these these reactions are uh, interesting. And this was a well this was a Facebook entry of Süddeutsche, and this is just um, an article by a very very distinguished uh, commentator, um, Leyendecker. And I, I, in fact, personally complained about this. And the, re the reply of Süddeutsche was that, well, that's the, the, the summary, that's the, like, 
the headline of the article. So you should be complaining about the article, basically. But so the question shouldn't be what are the reactions that just appear out of nowhere. Obviously, this is in a context and obviously this is a reaction to something that you put out there. And if this is polarizing, if well, obviously, this is an echo chamber effect. Well, and if, if we just want to talk about, well, demagogues, what, what does it mean? There's a nice definition some, by someone called Martin Morlock. Um, well, you can uh, work towards your political goal if you cater to the masses, if you are psychophantic, if you, if you try and approach their, their feelings and instincts and prejudices. And just the way how, how you want to uh, proceed to, to pursue your goals, uh, this would be a, a, a demagogue would, would present that their methods as the only true methods. And this is, well, alternativlos without, without alternative, a way of, a way of showing who's, who's the, who are the good guys in this, in this game. Well, we know the situation, the truth, uh, trademark, is the first to die in, in war. Why? Why is that? Because we have this effect of, of polarization. We have, well, that's us, the good guys, and we have them, who are obviously uh, the enemies. And that um, makes it quite obvious how to, how to evaluate these, these sides. And you can follow these, these traces or these dynamics very easily in a, in, a, in a random newspaper article. And I'd just like to pinpoint your attention to that, just to, so, to ask these questions. Who is the people who are being excluded? And who, what are the sides uh, that are maybe being drawn? So this is um, you, Commissar? Com com yeah. Uh, Gunther Oettinger. He's, he's a bit of a hate figure for a lot of people, even, even in reporting, even in current reporting. So he's like uh, the EU internet expert who knows nothing of the internet. And we have all that, like the West against Putin, uh, the, the good guys against Assad, the, the Greeks uh, versus Merkel, and obviously the, uh, the axis of the, well, good guys against the rest of the world. Well, these are the narratives you find in, in, in varied forms in, in public discourse or in, in the press. And it's essential to understand that we're being made uh, into a part of this us sphere. And that still means that we can have the need to distance ourselves from this artificial grouping and this can be a kind of bias this can be in a sort of sense of imbalance and we would in that case maybe try and distance ourselves from that or even exclude ourselves from certain us and them constructions and that was what i might uh, f what i found notable about this anja reschke commentary about about auschwitz if i were if if i were one of these demonstrators, one of these right-wing Pegida guys in Dresden, I would feel, well, excluded or ostracized by this uh, press lady or by people telling me, well, you're not part of us, this establishment of a distance. And that runs, runs counter to the old, well, well, there's this old BBC ideal, basically, of convincing, convincing the enemy, ch trying to, to make uh, someone else believe my own reporting um, more than counter-propaganda. But, well, you can, you can, of course, say, well, journalists would, would say we're, we're so objective and we don't, we don't partake in this us and them. But I think it's... Well, there's a, there's a famous journalist's quote, a German uh, newsmaker who says, uh, don't, well, collude, don't not, uh, don't, not even if it's a good cause, but don't attach yourself to this cause. This is um, Fuchsberger. Mach, mach dich nicht mit einer Sache gemein, you say in German, journalism training. 
kann man auch einfach die Unwahrheit. But of course it's um, it's also easy to uh, to um, to lie with facts by selectively picking facts and excluding others. I I think that you know proof is a is a beautiful thing, but that's not enough. Uh, and then there's the question of neutrality. What is neutral? And who decides what is neutral? And very often, it depends on the people you are talking to. Who are who are the people who um, approve of neutrality? And I assume that the people who are best suited to um, judging neutrality are those who aren't on your side already. And naturally, in journalism, whenever there are technically difficult subjects like net neutrality, there's a temptation to condense these, thi these things into, into simplified narratives to be able to sell it to your readers. And one famous example of this in um, debates on internet politics is um, this recursion to general narratives like um, freedom versus security. And this is child's play because the people who, you know, the people who report and people who decide don't even need to, to understand the technical background because they've heard lots and lots of talks and they know on which side they're supposed to be. So these narratives are often misleading and it just depends on who dominates um, the plain text. And um, then, of course, we, this can always be, be turned around. Um, and you, could, you might ask, what about German security when um, foreign states are now, now surveilling us? Where's, what, what happens to our freedoms? So to, to condense this, Whenever there are comments, and we mean comments in the comment section below an article, there are two options. You can either ignore them and solid, you know, be solidaric and say, oh, great, this is a brilliant article, and you, you spoke right from my heart. And interestingly, loads of, loads of people were shared Anja Restra's comment but it's um, apart from that, it's very rare for journalists to receive positive feedback. So the more popular option in the comments section is um, to um, to to you know oppose the journalist's point of view and to um, voice opinions that um, are excluded from general discourse, like um, you know pro Putin, and this can turn out quite interesting but I'd I would say that the um, most there's going to be the biggest uproar when journalists polarize and um, there's been a lot more polarization recently but um, it's ten, there's there's going to be a tendency of for for readers' comments to turn against the uh, opinion of the uh, of the journalists. And I think it's it's not possible to completely separate these comments from uh, the, the article, article itself because there's, again, this tendency to uh, create more emotions, to generate more clicks. Uh, I need technical help, please. <laughs> well, actually, I got the text on this.
Oh, diese kleine Zwischenpause können wir ja kurz nutzen. Oh, we can use this break to defragmentate the seats again. Can everyone who's got a free seat next to him raise his hand, please? Go get a seat, get your hand partner. Okay, ich, ich glaub, ihr könnt die Hände wieder runternehmen. Okay, I think you can put down your hands again. Thank you. <coughs> so. Oh Gott. Oh Gott. Sofort los. Um, We're about to start. Okay. Wo befinden wir uns right. mit der Kommentardebatte? Where are we now with the commentary debate? Well, first of all, I'd like to show you a slide. It shows a tweet of mine. Actually, I actually wanted to comment the tweet down there that the authors actually don't read the commentaries and the commentators don't read the text. That's some, yeah, basically the whole speech in one sentence. <laughs> But I will explain myself now properly. Ever since humanity, the birth of humanity, there have been debates. Well, if you think about um, artifacts in the museum, Well, there are debates online who actually <coughs> end up in virtual debates. Managers, for example, they try to dissolve those fights in the internet and to enable a um, conversation on facts. So the group dynamics can be actually dis can actually dissolve themselves so they don't need a mediator but yeah it's not the case usually so I usually like to work that way that I like people to communicate and I want a lot of people the biggest amount of people with the biggest amount of um, points of views to communi communicate with each other so yeah before I forget I'd like to mention one thing which um, Andre mentioned before. It's not only that one group says that the commentaries are bad and they have to be kicked. There's always like different positions and every like position claims that their commentaries claim uh, stays or that the other commentaries have to be kicked so that they are redundant. So actually We, we're not actually fighting against an agenda, which is always like being so. Most a uh, lot of the news portals um, have um, f have a volume of several thousand commentaries, so we don't even have the time to consider any political any political point of view you might have in private. And uh, therefore, uh, within seconds or possibly a minute uh, that we ha of time we, we have for each comment, um, that's the time we have to, to decide whether it stays or whether it goes. And we don't even, we don't even have the time to, to worry about whether people think like us as a person. And then in the, um, in the refugee crisis, during the refugee crisis, um, Some news sites just partly or fully closed their comment sections. For instance, the, the Süddeutsche Zeitung or the uh, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung in Germany. But they seem to have uh, relaxed their practice a bit. And um, in the meantime, most of the larger news sites have um, open comment sections and um, only close it for certain subjects. But um, if it, you know, if 
news sites were to um, to give up entirely and close their comment sections entirely, like um, the Süddeutsche does, which only allows a very very narrow set of debates, then they should ask themselves a question of you know what they themselves did wrong, because it's always a multifaceted debate. Um, comments in general have a bad image, a bad reputation. Um, there's a study by Echo and Newsroom that says that in 2011, 68.2% of readers, 68.2% of journalists said that the discussion was mostly um, mostly sticking to facts, and this is now down to 49%. So they. they lost quite a bit and um, in uh, my experience most journalists don't really take part in the discussions that happen below their articles. Um, in my study it's 40.3% uh, of journalists and as I know from my work it's always the same journalists who engage in this debate with their readers, but most of them ignore it or say, yeah, the comments, that's that's terrible, it's, it's just horrible. And this is one of the reasons why comments have a bad reputation, they're always below the article, which um, already sets a sort of hierarchy, because the article is on top and the comments are below. The users are often don't feel taken don't feel like they're being taken seriously, and the rules on deletion or the rules of use aren't very very obvious. But um, then again, the community doesn't always bother reading them, and we receive a lot of emails who um, wonder why something was deleted, and uh, they get terribly upset. And we reply that, you know, we deleted your comment because it was a reply to a comment that was against the terms of use. So the, the comment itself was fine, but um, the original comment, which was a reply, wasn't. And many people don't realize that there are very, very simple reasons. Another problem is uh, user interfaces. They're often bad. Most news sites are still designed um, designed to look like, like newspapers and the, the comment sections are like letters to the editor. So you could do a lot more if you were to reduce this analogy to printed paper and if you were to uh, embed the readers more into your, into your workflow. For instance, allowing them to publish their own articles or having events, holding events with actual readers or having chats where authors chat with their readers, which is really cool, but which is often hard to do technically. And uh, there's an optical thing as well. Many news sites um, force you to have you know have comments collapse by default and then you can expand them but you um, you redirect it to to another page so you don't see them immediately they happen in another place and this um, this makes uh, makes this gap worse so editors need to to regain the trust of their readers so that they're able to, to keep the pace with the current developments. Is censorship taking place? This summer we had the impression that um, due, to, uh, due to the refugee crisis, there was a lot of attention to the comment sections. But I'm, I'm, so I'm not entirely sure if the comments actually did get worse, or if there was a group of people who hadn't commented a lot previously, has now started to, to 
go online and um, and comment comment our articles. So I think there's been a bit of a shift. Um, in the 90s, newspapers started uh, starting putting news online without thinking about about revenue, and now finally these things are are what's holding them back. And um, it's obvious today that we need uh, we need new f new online formats that we need to find new ways of publishing news, and the the future is going to be somewhere online, but we don't know where. New sites live from the clicks to their articles, which in turn um, generate profit, and from that follows it. Um, follows clickbait and um, you know optimizing for for clicks and um, yes making making people more likely to click on your on your articles or did it break down Ah, oh, it's too bad. Hat es? Nee, also bei mir eigentlich nicht. That's a classic of a comment. I'm just here because of the commentaries. That's what it says. Um, yeah, it's about the people who don't read the article and just put the comment. That's a tactic of polarization of media and this is also a tactic that the trolls use so the question is does the net like the internet actually turn us into trolls well depends this is what we have to discuss about what can we do against it and what is a troll actually a troll for me is a person who's not interested in the um, exchange of opinions and is just trying to provoke and yeah, and it's just targeting at the author of the article or other people. And they just yeah, use other people to talk about themselves. So they just try to attract the attention and eliminate the discussion. But the uh, trolls are not the only problem. The problem is that we have um, lost the ability to discuss, like we don't know how to discuss things. <clears throat> of course, I got some commentaries for you. <laughs> okay, I, shall I read them out? Well, okay, this user is called um, the Merkel, the mother, the Jewish pig, um, the old whore um, can't, at Wikipedia we um, eliminated the sentence that um, the pig's mom is a Jewish, um, Polish person and <laughs> luckily um, we copied it to her home pages. Why um, do you hide that, you sons of a bitch? 
Okay, we got another comment. Okay, I'll piss on every one of you. Uh, where's the um, patriot who's actually against um, Merkel and actually eliminates um, all these those betrayerish politicians with a shot in the head? Well, sometimes actually people, you have to laugh about it, but I actually read an article about it lately. And it was about Frauke Petri and her um, invitation to Plasberg. And the article was of Falk Heunemann um, about six rhetorical tricks of Heike Petri, which was interesting because the tricks, the rhetorical tricks, correspond to the tricks that trolls use. So what Heike Petri did was she didn't let her opponent speak. And she said, yeah, that's what others do as well, so that's relativization. And yeah, she well, she used wrong terms, apparently, and deviated from the topic, like to completely different topic. And the fifth point was, it's just fun. Yeah, so she... And yeah, at last she just shouted like, and um, when nothing else helped. So one of my theses is um, that trolls consider themselves artists and they are actually competing with journalists um, about the status. So this is also the reason why trolls are actually so difficult to handle because you can't really disencourage them. Everyone who tries actually to disencourage the trolls actually in support to the trolls. So don't feed the troll. Um, yeah, just brings it straight to the point because ignorance is actually um, what disencourages the trolls. Okay, the perception of art says that the communication works from the artist to the perspective. So the artist actually doesn't really get the reaction of the perspective. Okay, this is the classical perception. And it's, um, yeah, in the press it's very similar today that a lot of authors and journalists don't realize what the users think of their articles. So there's also journalists who can only maintain their independence if they don't care about the opinions of other people, the users and the readers. So, yeah, they don't let themselves be influenced through other people. And this is what I've heard of uh, journalists. And I think, okay, when our age of clicks, where clicks gain importance, they're actually yeah, forced to orientate at the public, like the viewers. Okay, I'd try to um, just keep it short. The question is, how to moderate? Um, do you moderate um, beforehand or afterwards? Do you, or do you, yeah, do you do it before or do you do it the other way around? So these mechanisms are usually not obvious to, to the readers. Well, that in that case, you wouldn't see the worst of them. So that's, that's actually the tactic that, that most news outlets are, are using today with the notable exception of Facebook, and that's the like, classic example where just some problematic things might in fact remain. And so the select, oh well, gardening in advance is the, well, the most obvious tactic in a way. Well, actually the time is already almost over. I did have a lot of nice, nice little quotes here for you and I'll just, just flick through. Um, just random abuse, but of course, um, someone someone writing just um, to 
describe our work and also address us as commentators and um, this actual actually claimed well I'm contributing to keeping your place as a commenter commentary moderator in in place so you can censor it right now so, and that's XKCD you can you can see it yourself well my last question would have been sort of more hypothetical I'll have to leave it out this time but um, just to, as maybe to, th to think on, what would the ideal comment section actually look like? <laughs> Another user commentary. The number of male refugees um, arrived, uh, that arrived in, in Germany in 2015 uh, exceeds the number of US military sort of think about it well quality what do you mean quality thanks a lot yeah vielen dank für diesen so there's there's no time for sections for, for questions um, the the time is over and so well, there is a little bit left, but um, sorry about the abrupt end. So we can start right away. Okay, then einmal da drüben. You can still ask questions, even if it doesn't look like it. Um, a question from the floor. What I would have liked to have heard, what, uh, well, my question is, what do we have these comment sections at all? Uh, for for at all, because obviously the readers are the the user use case that journalists should should kind of uh, address. And well, you said no, they're, they're perfectly content. Well, and everyone else with with opposing opinions, well, they'll obviously flood flood the 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 commentary with their with their toxic remarks. That's just even if you're like on site online, a weekly German newspaper. You can't stand being in that, or why not just close it all down? I mean, you can still discuss it on all the rest of the open web. Aren't just these these um, comment sections just uh, still basically an artifact or just to keep garnering clicks and don't really have that dis debate function anymore? Yes, I, I understand what you say. Um, in principle, if comments work, it can be very dynamic and um, be be very good for both parties because users have the opportunity to um, feed information back to uh, back to news uh, news sites that they wouldn't otherwise get. For instance, on Twitter, there are people who um, <coughs> live tweet photos from war sites, which would be very very hard to get otherwise. So it can be can be a very very good thing. But you have to maintain it. You have to make an effort to, to maintain it. You have to invest a lot of time. And websites have to, have to change. They have to be built differently. They simply don't work on the, uh, on the model that they use today. Do please keep quiet if you're coming and going because we're still in the Q&A session. And another question from the floor. Well, about all these trolls, like if you're excluding them from mainstream news sites, I'm not actually sure that that's the best situation. And they're not actually there where you can still approach them maybe with counter speech, but isn't that even even a more scary idea if they like retreat into closed sections? So what is, uh, well for you, what's the goal with the trolls? Where, where do you just want them to disappear or if so, where do they go? Oh, I'm glad for each comment that I'm allowed to, um, to, um, to moderate and to, to allow. Uh, especially comments that don't fit into my my view of the world, because this allows me to prove that, you know, hey, we're fair. I think you need to reach a debate where the people who are now trolls, um, you know, the reaches of people we, we consider trolls and allows them to um, to start a reasonable debate and we need to we need to 
we need an opportunity for people from various political camps to be able to voice their opinions. And that's something we don't have today. Well, we are going to talk about the, the technical design of this comment, comment section. If you look at something like gamification of the, of the user interface, um, we have a, like we do have a big variety of possibilities of, and this the technical details might quite uh, might determine the kind of forum you 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 uh, you provide. So you can maybe prevent uh, with technical means that a community kind of tips or goes sour. But the 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 return question or the the corollary would be what's What's the benefit for the trolls? What's their motivation and what's their incentive to, to do that? And how can you maybe address that? So for instance, in Heiser, German media, very well-known forum. Well, you have a kind of editing system. So some successful and maybe more moderate uh, and informative comments are, well, pushed up to the top in a way that Reddit, Reddit is doing it maybe similarly. And, uh, oh, well, other outlets are experimenting with just blanking out un unwanted content, just so you see white space. And I think you can actually design better comment sections. So clearly people who want to troll, well, they'll do it somewhere, and if you, well, send them out of yours, they'll do it somewhere else. But, well, you have something like a troll subculture, like if you look into 4chan, which is a little but a troll board. But that's a, that's a cult culture and maybe pop culture and impulse in itself, so... If I can just sort of throw that question back, is uh, that well, what's what's the what's in it for the troll, really trolling, by trolling? And uh, that's all we have time for. So no further questions, I'm afraid. But thank you again very much for this very interesting talk.